Yeah... Elden Ring is my game of the year. Yeah, etc, etc. It's hardly a hot take to say that the most critically acclaimed and one of the best-selling games of the year was your favourite. It's an unexciting opinion. You don't need to elaborate, really. Now, if someone said Gungrave Gore was their game of the year, I'd want to hear them explain that. Someone's probably out there who sincerely believes this. Do they just really like PS2 third-person shooters? Are edgy anime characters back in fashion? But with Elden Ring, the goodness is almost self-evident. Everyone and their mothers has made videos talking about how good it is, ranging from small recommendations to epic treatises on why Rani is the only acceptable option for all your maidening desires. Ah, oh, remember when people were talking about maidenless behaviour when this came out? That was fun. Regardless, none of this actually changes the fact that Elden Ring is my game of the year. It feels special. It's not very often a game comes around that manages to make this insane an impact, breaking out from niche series to undeniable mainstream appeal. And all of this from a developer whose first Souls foray ended up with different publishers worldwide, simply because Sony didn't believe it would succeed. So I thought I'd run down the core reasons why I did in fact love this game so much. If you haven't played Elden Ring yet, be aware I'm going to be showing stuff from throughout the entire game. If you don't want spoilers, frankly I'm shocked you haven't been spoiled already, but this video won't be for you. With that out of the way, let's get started on this journey. 1. The World to Explore The most important reason is the feature that was most touted before release, the big wide open world. It's probably one of the best open worlds I've inhabited in a long while, feeling fresh and invigorating in a year where others have begun to feel stale and even demoralising. How does it manage this? A lot of reasons, honestly. It's hard to condense my thoughts on a game that took me 120 hours to beat, so it's best to look at just a few tricks it employs that I'd honestly like to see other games try. Firstly, this is an open world you must explore. I mean actually, truly explore. You might think, well Jack, don't you have to explore every open world? Well, not quite. There's a difference between traversing an open world and exploring one. For example, another of the year's big open world games, Horizon Forbidden West, constantly inundated me with map icons wherever I went, and I could hardly see where I wanted to go with all the stuff littering the map screen. There's clearly a lot of effort here, what with this satellite photography vibe the game map is giving off, yet I can't make out anything distinct beyond abstract colours. Just look at all these icons. Each time you link up with a strolling Robodino open world radio tower, you're treated to even more icons everywhere, telling you where to go and what you can find. You will never look in one direction of horizon and travel unsure what you will find. You'll only hop from objective to objective. You're not exploring this open world. It's being explored for you. You're just going to the most recommended tourist destinations. When you eventually find a map in Elden Ring, it just gives you a map, as in a flat piece of paper that tells you the basic geography of the area. It's up to you to actually go out and find what's out there. Dungeons and caves are added to the map only when you discover them, and while there can sometimes be clues nudging you in certain directions, that's all it is. A nudge. If you're the keen-eyed map reading type, what with all your merit badges and neckties, you can look at the map, notice some particular shape in geography or ways in which the map leads your eyes, and go off under your own power. Who knows what waits for you? The world feels untamed, mysterious, full of wonders unknown with no telling what might be around the next corner, and the game doesn't want to detract from that by pointing you exactly where to go to find things, at least without some effort on your part. The sense of satisfaction from finding something is a ping of pure pleasure from beginning to end. And there's another clever trick the game does that enhances that feeling. It puts cool stuff in the world. Does that seem obvious again? Does that seem like everyone does that? Well you could have fooled me, as these open worlds copy and paste the same things over and over. How many bandit camps have you done this year? Did you do them all? 
Ooh, do it and we'll give you some equipment you'll never use or something. Elden Ring does have repeated content in theory, namely some dungeons and catacombs, and while some of them can feel familiar, it doesn't keep track of how many you've done, and it doesn't expect you to do them all. That would be an unreasonable ask anyway, given some of them are so hidden. Doing them all is unnecessary, just do what you find and have a fun time. The game doesn't actually keep score of much outside the get all the item achievements for completionists, and nowhere near as aggressively as most open world games do. Instead it just lets you move at your own pace and find things as they come, and things that other players might not have found. How many games have treasure chests that will transport you into the middle of a dungeon across the world in an incredibly high level region of the world map? Did you find a secret boss out in the world who only appears at one place at one time of day? See some mobs fighting in the wild? That's pretty cool. How about a location in the game that other people might not have found? Just a small little place that really stuck with you that told its own story. These are just a handful of the places that feel so much more exciting than yet another bandit camp to clear out. I would talk excitedly with my friends about what I saw, what I found in the world, and they would share their stories too. These water cooler moments litter the game. There's always something out there for you to find that will stick in your memory. But this is the world in its minutia. Things are also interesting when viewed from a grand scale. To bully Horizon some more, the game has many impressive vistas of its post-rebirth American West, from deserts to mountain valleys to forests to jungles, and more urban and science fiction styled areas. Yet I can't help but feel when I play the game that everywhere is functionally identical. They don't look the same, but how I interact with them is. Nowhere feels too different to one another. Sure there are different monsters everywhere, but that's not what I'm talking about. I mean the actual act of walking around and engaging with the world. I don't change up the way I play based on which environment I'm in. It feels somewhat mindless. Elden Ring has a wide collection of varied biomes and it's impressive how different the game makes them feel. Limgrave is where you start, a grassy hill type area that likes to place you high up so you can look down and see more of it, while still tucking plenty of hidden treats inside its forests and woodlands. Pretty standard. Good beginner location. The Weeping Peninsula is more of a craggy and wet version of Limgrave, sort of like Scotland to Limgrave's England, even though this is to the south. The map design is a touch more oblique, so you have to engage a little more to uncover its secrets. Then there's Lierna of the Lakes, a massive shallow lake and gnarly waterbound trees. It's hard to see where on earth you're even going. Forget hiding secrets, a lot of this area is just plain hidden, but it still knows when to throw in enemies and ruins to keep things dynamic. The water itself can hide things waiting to hinder you, so the area creates a sense of paranoia. How you explore Limgrave isn't how you explore Lierna. Then there's the winding, disjointed Altus Plateau, an area that seems flat and easy to move around when first encountering it, but the uprooted, uneven plates often mean taking the long way round. The mountaintops of the giants is precarious and tricky to navigate, a perfect challenge for players at the end of the game, to say nothing of the Halig Tree and Faramazula. Then there's Kaelid. Good Lord Kaelid. Not only is this place, a monstrous, terrifying hellscape that frankly I was not expecting to be so close to the starting area, but if you want to talk about having various methods of engaging with the world, Kaelid is pretty unique. This area is so hostile that I was big on rushing past its many twisted monstrosities, even towards the end game. But if you want to explore, you have to slow down and actually deal with whatever there is that's waiting to give you a bad time. And that's just one part of it. We haven't even talked about the Miyazaki brand poison swamp in the area, which has you wanting to stick to your horse out of the mire as you try to navigate and deal with whatever on earth is here. And this swamp plays differently to the other big swamp in the game, where you have no horse and have to make your way across using platforms. The world of Elden Ring is incredible. There's so much to see, so much to do, and so many unique ways to die. Two, mixing gameplay up after 13 years. Demon's Souls came out in 2009 and solidified much of the gameplay of the Souls games to come. 
hell. Kingsfield came out even before that, so some of the ideas being used in Souls-like games are positively ancient. So Elden Ring could probably have done with sprucing things up a bit, as polished as the gameplay formulas are at this point. One big thing the game introduced was jumping. Or easy jumping, I should say. Nobody liked doing that weird sprint leap thing. No one. Now we can hop and leap to our heart's content. And boy, can my heart fit in a lot of contend. First introduced in Sekiro, and now jazzing up established, traditional Souls gameplay, jumping was literally a new dimension to combat that's a massive boon to new players in the early game. The leaping jump attack is like kryptonite to introductory enemies, so I felt incentivized to perfect it and incorporate it in my arsenal. But the jumping also changed how players interact with the environment. Gone are the times where a tiny ledge could stop us. Virtually nothing can stop you now, and the level design has changed to accommodate that. Not only is platforming a crucial part of the level design, but you even need to get bold with it at times, such as accessing some of the secret areas in Stormvale Castle, hopping across rooftops, or navigating some of its more dilapidated areas. Some of it can get a little tricky at times, but don't worry, there's someone who's way better at platforming than you. This bad boy can fit so many jumps in him. Two, in fact. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting, in the run up to this game, that a not insignificant amount of time would be spent horse platforming. But there you go. Torrent is a shocking development in the video game horse world. A mount that is actually gameplay first. A beast that feels like a one-to-one -one extension of my video game avatar, rather than a feisty AI animal I'm merely making suggestions to. Games that use rideable animals like that aren't doing anything wrong, but Elden Ring's fully responsive torrent was absolutely the way to go for this game. The elegant nature of using torrent allows for incredible feats of agility, hopping from place to place with ease. Narrow gaps and precarious ledges mean nothing to this champion companion. And they even have a double jump! A horse that can double jump, being one of my favourite game mechanics of the year, is not a thought I expected to enter my head. But there we go. Ah, lest we forget though, this game is not all about jumping. It's all going to come back to the combat once again. Mounted combat is mechanically quite simple, yet it can radically change how you approach a fight. A single weapon swing while mounted hits harder than normal, so it's quite fun to ride past enemies while popping their heads off. Nice, easy, good way to get a little extra runes when you're out and about. Mounts versus mounts? Cool, fun, new way to mix things up. But it's the big bad bosses that make using Torrent feel the most meaningful. Sure, you could bury yourself in the anus of a giant demon, or hack at its ankles until its soul leaves its body, and rolling away whenever it so much as moves in a way I don't like. But with Torrent, you can instead look at using the vastly improved maneuverability offered by your trusty steed to get an advantage. It's not a total no-brainer improvement, though. If Torrent takes enough damage or gets hit by a particularly glancing blow, you'll be thrown off and getting back up off the ground is a painfully slow process. Almost as painful as what will likely happen to you as you try and get up. I suppose I should talk about the actual regular combat. It's really fun! It must be after all, it's the same combat that we've been seeing for 13 years now. However, once you're in the game, you might discover that, even if you recognise the moves, the tempo of this dance has changed. Bosses are now not only faster, but have far more rhythmic complexity. Miyazaki is wise, we have mastered dodging for years, so the enemies stagger their attacks, and often have both ranged and melee moves, and sometimes even know when we're trying to heal. Less a fan of that last one, to be honest. What this means is that if you're going to go in and insist to play this like a regular Souls game, you're probably going to have a tricky time. Like trying to eat a sandwich using only your elbows. For a start, it feels like the game wants melee players to at least have some kind of ranged option be it magic or otherwise. You certainly get no shortage of levels throughout the game, where you could buff up a few stats to get yourself some kind of long-distance murder mysticism. The game even encourages stat rerolls, including hiding some very important lore behind a spell that a lot of people probably had to rebirth themselves in order to perform. That's as close to a confirmation that it wants you mixing up your playstyle as we'll get. I'm still gonna be the big swordman though. Strength builds for life! But arguably the most interesting addition is, on top of summoning named characters and players, there's a new core mechanic of being able to summon spirits, NPCs that will fight alongside you. 
I'm going to be real, you're mostly going to see me summon the Mimic. They were a little broken, even after nerfs. And yet in my fights against the Mimic, I never even took damage? Spirits were a good way to not only get an extra damage dealer onto the field, but even more crucially they can take the pressure off of you, as the enemy focuses on them instead, allowing you to potentially heal up safely or direct your attention elsewhere. Certainly needed towards the end of the game, Jesus Christ Malekith. Spirits aren't invincible though, far from it, so knowing when to actually pop a spirit is really important. It's more thoughtful than simply standing at the back of a room when you begin a fight and popping them off. That's right, I said the spirit system takes skill! Don't worry about those weirdos who say you didn't beat the game if you used it, or used magic, or rolled, or whatever. Those people still have a sandwich to eat! 3. A commitment to a maze. Sometimes I feel I'm playing a game just to kill the time. The experience is just occupying my hands and my brain and I feel absolutely nothing as I go through. Sometimes it feels like the game industry is striving to make this numbing baseline the intended experience, like we all should be eating nothing but oatmeal every single day. How wonderful then, that Elden Ring decided that instead, this is how players should feel when playing a game. I haven't touched Elden Ring since May this year, and yet I can still recall so much of it, because the game is packed to the brim with memorable moments. I remember stepping outside for the first time and seeing the wide open expanse around me, with the landscape practically littered with curiosities I couldn't wait to explore. I remember finding an elevator in the middle of nowhere, taking it down for what felt like an age, and my breath being taken away as I discover a huge underground area, as expansive as any zone in the above ground, and filled with all kinds of things to see and fight. I remember the rush of beating so many of the game's bosses that gave me problems. I remember the thrill of finding new places in the world and new people to talk to. I remember meeting Rani and feeling very inappropriate things. I especially remember finding the Lake of Rot and cursing Miyazaki's name out loud from my sofa. So much of the game sticks out and feels unique to Elden Ring. I was constantly engaged because the game always had new tricks up its sleeve. However, if I had to pick one singular moment from the game that would be my defining memory of the experience, then there's only one boss I can think of. General Star Scourge Radan is one of my favourite bosses that From Software has made in a long time. Or at least, I think Bloodborne was a long time ago. The fight against him is so unlike any other boss within the Souls-like games, and it's amazing that he's barely at the halfway point of the game. Even after so many years, there still can be a boss that is a completely fresh experience. Firstly, Radan gets no small amount of build-up. We enter an ominous castle, a haunting male choir drifting in the background, where we're told a festival is being held. Our best buddies are here too, like Blythe and Alexander, whose quests were maybe how you found the castle in the first place. When we actually talk to the guy hosting the event, we get a full-on cutscene of the backstory of General Radan, which never happens in these games. Pre-boss cutscenes where they banter at us? Sure, but giving us an expository cutaway scene outside of our player's perspective, that's much rarer from From Software. In the tale, they explain that Radan has long lost his mind and is cursed ever to wander his final battleground. And this festival is put on in his honour so someone can finally grant the general an honourable death. His troops respect him so much, they refuse to let him wander the sands in such a state. I could only wish to be so loved by my fellow man. Would you do the same for me? Probably not. Alright, time to go show him what for. The endless sand stretching out between us as we prepare for our final confrontation. Good luck to the people who tried to solo this guy because, oh boy, does this demigod have no care for you. He's pinging arrows at you from so far away and you have to close the distance, but along the way you'll see summoning signs along the ground of the fighters who are also here. At first I thought it was just the one person that I was summoning, but no, I'm actually summoning everyone who's taking part in the festival. Blythe, Alexander, 
Even Patches is here for some reason. And it's going to take all of us, every single one of us, to take this guy down. General Radan is not an easy fight. Atop his beloved steed, the way he moves is unpredictable. And while he may focus on other fighters than you, he can often make deadly sweeps that will hit everyone. To say nothing of his gravity magic. He also has a lot of health, so you're going to feel the need to have everyone around you in order to just do enough damage to topple this Goliath. He is, or at least was before he got nerfed a fair bit, this footage is all pre-nerf, a roadblock for a significant portion of the entire game. You've got to prove your worth in fighting this titan, and it genuinely feels like a great battle. Patches, get back here and fight this demigod! It makes it all the more satisfying when you finally start to do well, really taking this guy down a peg or two, and making some real progress. Wait, where'd he go? Um, what's going... Oh, fuck. It's this second phase, where the general becomes even tougher, faster, and the sky changes from the red dusk to a black starry night. You are reminded, violently, that you are not facing some random jobber here. This general was a god, considered one of the greatest soldiers in the entire realm, and even poisoned, crazed, only half alive, he is still an absolute monster. And you have to prove yourself worthy of beating him, of granting him a noble death in order to move on to the rest of the game. I love this fight. There may be more mechanically interesting bosses in the game. There may be ones of equal visual splendor, or ones that also drive a striking impression. But when I think of my time in Elden Ring, no memory burns quite as bright as the fight I had with General Star Scourge Radar. And after all that, on beating him, you discover his Conqueror of the Stars moniker was very much earned, as he was using his gravity magic to keep the stars from moving, and now free, a shooting star strikes into the earth, opening new ways for you to go by changing a part of the world permanently. What an incredible way to end this fight, and to make you feel like you really accomplished something. Also, Radan loved his horse, and I like that detail. I, I just wanted to bring that up before we end. And that's Elden Ring. I do wonder what From Software will end up doing with the game, if we'll get DLC or something, but also what comes next. I know they're making Armored Core, excited for that even though I've not played the other games before, but I mean next with the Souls type games. I hope we keep exploring new settings, but when the bar for the scale of the adventure has risen so dramatically? What on earth can you do? Will things stay so grand and open? Can we go back to the tighter experiences like Bloodborne ever again? It's impossible to say, but I know I can't wait to see whatever they come up with next. And all that is why Elden Ring is my game of the year. Which is what I would say if we weren't talking about the real game of the year. Gungrave Gore, baby! No, just kidding. It's Dwarf Fortress. I have no idea what I'm doing, and I love it. Someone please tell me how I dispose of these corpses. My dwarves are getting very sick. A tool! Put down the one! Shoot him those like a noble!
Thank you for watching, and thank you for my patrons for supporting me. Patrons get access to a feed where I talk about what I'm currently doing and will be doing in the future. They also get to ask questions at the end of videos, which is what we'll do right now. What do you think you did on the videos that have millions of views different from the ones that don't? The short answer is I don't know, but iron lung. Like, I've got little ideas. Is it YouTube's bias towards horror videos? Was it just a good combination of title and thumbnail? Or was it because when you mouse over it, it shows the fried chicken in the video as like a little video preview? Fact is, I don't know. But regardless, however many views these videos get, I'm still going to be doing the videos I want to make. I don't want to chase algorithms here. So I guess what I think really is, don't know, don't really care. When it comes to the awards part of the Game Awards, what would you do differently to make it feel more like an actual grown-up awards presentation and show? I'm guessing we're ignoring the commercial aspect of it. And we're going to ignore the easy don't let weirdos onto your stage? To be honest, I'm not really sure what you can do differently. When you think about how do you pick nominations, asking a bunch of games writers and media outlets to submit their own nominations for these categories, that sounds like on paper a reasonable thing to do. But then we get things like 12 Minutes was nominated for Best Indie Game last year. Because I guess games journalists just think, oh, what was an indie game I played that year? Uh, yeah, that one. That terrible one. Award shows are all just popularity contests and people in a circle or making one another feel better. Like what's a grown-up award show for films? You gonna say the Oscars? Alright, that'll do for now. Thanks for watching. Remember to wash your elbows before every meal.